Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our worship at Christ Presbyterian Church. Uh, before I introduce our guest pastor, I, the preacher, I would like to uh, just mention that we have a uh, fellowship lunch, luncheon today, end of the month, uh, which will follow the uh, Sunday school time. So if you are, uh, we, we welcome everybody. There's always plenty of food. So if you have nowhere else to go, we'd ask that you join us, and then we'll have evening, uh, afternoon worship immediately following the luncheon. Uh, we are pleased to have with us the Reverend Dr. Busey, Camden Busey. I, last time I used the term doctor, he doesn't like that, but I'll just say, say it now. Uh, he's a graduate of uh, Westminster Theological Seminary. He's the uh, former pastor of uh, Grays Lake, our church, OPC church there. He's now the associate pastor because uh, he's very busy with his podcast, uh, Protestant Reform, uh, Reform, Reform, yeah. Reform Forum. I knew I was going to mess it up. Uh, uh, which is uh, involved with the teachings of the Protestant Reformation and the, uh, and the catechisms and the creeds and so on. So if you want to find a good podcast, I call it a web-based. I'm, I'm a little bit old to use the term podcast. I really don't know what that means. But <laughs> anyway... Uh, you're welcome to join us, uh, join, join in that and, uh, and listen in. Uh, he's also been uh, elected uh, historian of the, uh, of, the de of the denomination that was formerly my brother's position, and he has since retired, so at GA he was elected to this position. So uh, that, that's, that's a real blessing for us and for our, our, our denomination. So uh, at, uh, without uh, anything else to say, I would like to welcome Reverend Busey to our pulpit this morning. Good morning. It's a joy to be with you. I believe the last time I was here uh, filling the pulpit was roughly a year ago, last summer. And uh, it's a delight to be with you again today. I always love coming out here. And it's a joy to fellowship together in the Presbytery, even though very soon I think we'll be <laughs> dividing north and south. But that's just on paper. We, we're not dividing in terms of our fellowship and love toward one another, of course. Um, receive now the greeting of our Lord and the salutation. Uh, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, let's take a moment for silent prayer as we prepare for worship. Amen. Our Lord calls us to worship this morning in Psalm 147. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God, for it is pleasant and a song of praise is fitting. Well, let us indeed then raise our voices and sing this song of praise to our God as he has called us to worship. Please stand as we now sing hymn number two, O Worship the King, hymn number two. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let us pray and go to our Lord, and we'll conclude that brief prayer with the Lord's Prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we rejoice that this day we may gather together and we may come to worship you. We praise you, O Lord, for your kindness and your grace toward us who are sinners. Our Father in heaven, we rejoice that you have brought us here, that you have maintained uh, this congregation of your people throughout the years. And we pray, Lord, that you would bless this congregation today. And as we gather together on this special day to worship, Lord, we pray that you would meet with us. Help us also to recognize that our worship is not merely earthly worship, but through the mediation of our Savior Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, as we gather together, we worship even in the heavenly places with the heavenly host. Father, all of your people, we gather together to worship you with one voice and with one heart. So, Lord, please calm our minds and, and our hearts. Help us, Lord, to lay aside the cares of, of the, the weak and to worship you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the one true and living God. For we pray now using the words that our Savior has taught us, praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen indeed. Uh, if you'll now turn with me to our profession of faith, and as the bulletin says, would let us please rise uh, for our profession of faith as we look to the Nicene Creed on page 846 in the hymnals. Page 846. And this is our opportunity to confess our faith with the saints around the world. This is one way that we recognize that we're not the only church. <laughs> as we gather here in Janesville, we rejoice but we also gather together with all the saints, and we get to recite and, and confess our faith together with the saints throughout the world who confess the same belief in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and with all the saints throughout the ages who also have believed on him. So now let us recite here the Nicene Creed on page 846. O oh, Christians, what do you believe? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten and made, being of one substance from the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and was seated at the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory, to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified. And we believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins and the hope for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And let us now sing our hymn of response. And as we prepare to eventually hear the word of God proclaimed, let's sing hymn number 311, Hail to the Lord's Anointed, number 311.
Please be seated. It's time for us to pray. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you, Father, for this day for this opportunity that we can come before your presence and worship. And we pray, Lord, that our worship brings glory to you, that your spirit will open our hearts and minds to the words preached. Father, we thank you that you have revealed yourself to us in creation and in your word. You are indeed the great God Almighty, the author and finisher of faith. The whole work of redemption is yours alone, that in every good work or thought found in us is the effect of your perfect will and grace. Indeed, Father, you are glorious in yourself. You are total, complete, and perfect. What a joy it is to know that in these very desperate times, you are in control over all things. You have set us apart from the world from the recognition, wretchedness of this world and you enable us by your spirit to be Christ-like before others. Thank you, Father, for granting us faith by the power of your Holy Spirit that by your son's sacrifice on the cross, we have salvation. Help us, Father, that we would grow in our faith each and every day by the means of grace, through prayer and scripture, to seek out our transgressions and to repent of our sins. Indeed, we are unworthy. We are sinners beyond more than we could ever acknowledge. We do not, nor can we ever earn the blessings we share in Christ our Redeemer. Thank you, Father, for calling us your chosen people by your goodness and mercy that we have been adopted into the covenantal household of God by your grace, enjoying the full privilege and inheritance as your sons and daughters. This is your day, Father, the heavenly ordinance of rest, the open door of worship, the record of your son's resurrection, and the seal of the Sabbath to come. Please grant us rich in abundance the blessings of the Lord's day as it was designed to impart. May our hearts and minds be removed from all worldly thoughts or cares. Help us, Lord, to remember this day and to keep it holy. We offer up our prayers to you this morning because you hear them. You answer them in accordance with your perfect will. You are forever faithful to your covenant people. And you have given us hope that is everlasting. We pray, Lord, for the sick, for those beset with illness, with health issues, or recovering or facing upcoming surgeries. We remember, we pray for William Gilkey's eyesight that it would prove that it would not be a detriment to his employment. We thank you, Lord, for his faith, for his testimony to others, because he knows by your, by your Holy Spirit that where, he, where to put his trust and where his faith is. We pray for no, Noreen, now, having known that she has completed her chemo treatment, treatments and waiting, waiting for lab results that she would be able to undergo a much needed stem cell transplant. We pray for the doctors that they provide good diagnosis and they make important, good, wise decisions regarding her care. We pray especially for her family as well during this very long and difficult time. And we are thankful for her faith and for theirs as well, that they can trust in you. Father, we pray for Elena, 
the granddaughter of Steve and Denise Phillips, awaiting the birth of their son on August 6th by induction. Father, we are saddened to hear that there is possibly a health issue related to his heart. Lord, uh, there could be blockage in his artery, but they won't know until the baby is born. We pray when that happens, the correct diagnosis would be made and the treatment would, be, would, would, be, would, go, would go well, there'd be good recovery, that this would correct the condition without consequence. We ask for all for your blessings on all our unborn children and the mothers, for Nicole, for Ruth. We thank you, Father, for the, for the gift of life. We pray for the parents in our congregation as they raise their children in accordance with your word, as they have vowed to do so before you. Enable them, Father, to lead by example, never compromising their faith. We're thankful for our older church members and friends of the church. We thank you for the blessings of good health. Please keep them healthy, but we thank you especially, Lord, for their witness and their example to us, for their testimony. We remember our young people, especially those that are away this time. We pray for John Ozinga, Mary Vincent, my son Robert, Abram Westrick, and for others. This time away, Lord, please keep them safe and strong in faith. We are thankful to see so many people here this morning, Lord, especially visitors and friends and family members. We pray for their travel, that you would keep them safe. We pray for everyone that travels this week, including those who do that each day for, in their employment. Father, we pray for the work of worldwide outreach for home missions, foreign missions, Christian ed. We thank you for our missionaries overseas in the Czech Republic, Haiti, Uganda, Asia, Ethiopia, Haiti, Quebec, the Ukraine. We pray especially for our missionary associates in those countries, including Karamoja in Uganda, that being for James and Esther Falkerts and Joanna Grove. We thank you, Lord, for the good reports of church plants in our denomination. As we learned this week, we've heard of the works of Christopher and Sarah Drew in Grand Forks, South Dakota. We pray, Lord, that their congregation would grow in, grow in faith and be strong, that they would find a suitable place for worship. We pray for Micah and Eileen Bickford in Farmington, Maine, and their outreach to the community. We also pray for our home, regional home missionaries in the denomination, for Mark Sumter in the Presbytery of the Southwest and David Chilton in the Presbytery of the South. We pray as well for our own uh, regional home missionary, Bruce Hollister, and for others. Thankful for them and their service as they establish, they assist in the establishment of church plants and explore unchurched areas for new home mission works. Father, we pray for our own church as we undergo this period of transition. We're thankful that we've been able to fill our pulpit. You've indeed blessed us. And we pray for our congregation as we embark on the search for a new pastor, that it would go well. Pray for the committee that it will be established as they labor during this important time of transition. Grant us wisdom, guide us through this. We pray, Lord, for our chaplains, those serving in the military for, and for first responders. We pray for the Presbyterian Reform Commission of chaplains and military personnel. We thank you, Lord, for their work much needed that there be food in their labors as they minister to our service men and women and our first responders. We pray, Lord, for the upcoming Rock County Fair and for those who will be staffing for our church there. Pray that we would have enough people to man the booths. We thank you, Lord, for that service and that there be a good reception with the community as we reach out to others and share the gospel. That your Holy Spirit will give us the words to speak and that their hearts would be open to you. We pray for the Millers who are preparing for their mission work in Pakistan. Pray for Tom as he embarks on August 6th 
ahead of his family, Lord willing, if he can get a flight to, the, to that country as he prepares for the family to arrive in October. We pray for the entire family and for their plans and for their work there. We pray for their own home church in Maryland if they seek a pastor too, that there'd be fruit from their labors there. And now, Lord, now, Lord, as we continue our worship this morning, be with Reverend Busey as he preaches your word to us. Please pour your spirit upon us and let each of us have hearts to receive your word with, a joy, with joy and delight. We pray this all in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who gives us the victory. Amen. At this time, I, I will ask the deacons to come forward to collect our tithes and offerings. Let us sing now our next hymn, number 161, O Christ, our hope, our heart's desire, hymn number 161. Let's stand as we sing.
please be seated. I invite you now to turn in your Bibles with me to 2 Samuel chapter 7. Our sermon text will be the latter half of this chapter, but uh, for the sake of, of context, and it's always to our benefit to read more of God's Word, so we'll start our reading at least 2 Samuel 7 at verse 1. Perhaps a well-known portion, this is the institution of the Davidic covenant, uh, but we come to see our Savior Jesus Christ as the ultimate King promised by our Lord 2 Samuel 7, at verse 1. Please give your attention now to the reading of God's holy, inspired, and inerrant word. Now when the king lived in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his surrounding enemies, the king said to Nathan the prophet, See, now I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells in a tent. And Nathan said to the king, Go do all that is in your heart, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord, Would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel? whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers. I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul, whom I put away from before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. In accordance with all these words and in accordance with all this vision, Nathan spoke to David. Then King David went in and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God? And what is my house that you have brought me thus far? And yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. You have spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come. And this is instruction for mankind, O Lord God. And what more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O Lord God. Because of your promise, and according to your own heart, you have brought about all this greatness to make your servant know it. Therefore you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you. And there is no God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. And who is like your people Israel? The one nation on earth whom God went to redeem to be his people, making himself a name and doing for them great and awesome things by driving out before your people, whom you redeemed for yourself from Egypt and nation and its gods. And you established for yourself your people, Israel, to be your people forever. And you, O Lord, became their God. And now, O Lord God, confirm forever the word that you have spoken concerning your servant and concerning his house, and do as you have spoken. And your name will be magnified forever, saying, The Lord of hosts is God over Israel, and the house of your servant David will be established before you. For you, O Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, have made this revelation to your servant, 
saying, I will build you a house. Therefore, your servant has found courage to pray this prayer to you. And now, O Lord God, you are God, and your words are true, and you have promised this good thing to your servant. Now, therefore, may it please you to bless the house of your servant, so that it may continue forever before you. For you, O Lord God, have spoken, and with your blessing shall the house of your servant be blessed forever. As far as the reading of God's word, let's go to him in prayer. O Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to us in this word. We know that it is the reading of the word of God, but especially the preaching of the, of the Lord that is indeed a means of grace. And we pray now that the spirit would continue to be upon us according to your promises. Build this house, Lord, we pray that you continue to build the house of the Lord by growing us in grace through the powerful working of the spirit according to the kingship and the, the prophethood and also the priesthood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who reigns and rules forever and ever and ever. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, this chapter of Second Samuel records God's dealings with David to establish an everlasting kingdom. And as we read just in 2 Samuel 7, 1 through 17, the first half, we learn of the binding of God in his purposes through the Son of God to establish this house of God. The binding of God, that might sound like a really weird phrase, but what we're talking about here is just the basics of covenant theology. You see, to understand God's word to David, we need to look at his dealings with his covenant people throughout the Old Testament, leading all the way up to this point, this point in time in which God reveals his will to David. We should know that God established the covenant of grace with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden from the very beginning. And he promised that the seed of the woman would one day crush the head of the serpent. And that sets the stage for all that is to come throughout the Old Testament, leading on into the New especially the climactic work of Jesus. We know early on in Genesis that God made a covenant with Abraham. He promised to Abraham that he would make of him a great nation. He promised to him a people as well as a place, a place for his people, his house to dwell. In Genesis 15, 4, the Lord said, This man shall not be your heir. That was Eliezer of Damascus, a servant in Abraham's house. The Lord said, this man shall not be your heir, but your very own son shall be your heir. And this is none other than the same seed of the woman that was promised in Genesis 3.15. Each and every covenant builds upon the last. And the successive covenants all the way through the Old Testament eventually zoom in on the ultimate figure, the ultimate and consummate fulfillment to all of the Lord's promises, the person of Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, true God and true man. Now, as we see this covenant that God makes with David many, many years later, some of the aspects of the covenant certainly are made with him and his house, and some of the aspects of the covenant refer to David's immediate son, Solomon, who would be king. We know that through several facts of history, but also references in Acts chapter 7. And it was, of course, David's son Solomon who built the temple for the Lord in Jerusalem between 966 and 959 B.C. So quite literally, Solomon built the house for the Lord. But ultimately, we know that's not the final and greatest fulfillment of this promise, is it? There's a greater house to be built, a greater temple, so to speak, where the Lord would dwell in his people and the ultimate son of David who would fulfill these covenantal promises is not Solomon, but David and Solomon point forward to David's greater son and David's Lord, Jesus Christ, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Jesus Christ is the son of God and the ultimate fulfillment of this promise. So we see the binding of God in which God agrees or establishes that he will do something. He binds himself by his own word, not by anyone else's. No one can twist God's arm. But God is committed to do this thing, to build this house, to establish the throne of David, and to fill that with the King of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. We know that Jesus is the fulfillment 
throughout the New Testament, particularly. The binding of God occurs now in his purposes through the Son of God, through Jesus. The genealogy in Matthew chapter 1 makes it very clear that David, his descendant, is Jesus Christ. Jesus descends from David. And Jesus himself makes many claims which speak to the promises that God gives to David in 2 Samuel 7. He says he is the Son of God in Matthew 27 and Mark 1. He says he will build a temple in Matthew 26, Mark 14. He says that he possesses an eternal throne in Matthew 19. He also says that he possesses an imperishable kingdom in Luke 22. And those last two claims specifically rest on the foundation of God's promise in 2 Samuel 7, 12. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you who shall come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. And then a little later in verse 15, my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul whom I put away from before you. And what God did to the dynasty of Saul, he will never do with the dynasty of David. And David then responds to God's grace, to God's condescension to him. And we see that now in our section, starting in verse 18. How would you respond if you hear this word from the prophet, the word of the Lord coming to you, that he will establish your house, you will be king and your descendants will reign on the throne forever and ever on into the future. Well, David is humbled. He responds with humility. The Lord has exalted him, and yet it doesn't go to his head. He doesn't run out to the town and start to say, you guys have to hear what is happening to me and to my folk. I'm the king forever. Isn't that great? No, he is humbled before the Lord. Which may prompt us to ask, if we are to apply this to our own hearts and if the Spirit would apply it to us, what could we possibly say or do to thank our Lord for what he has done in our lives. Now, none of us are going to receive a promise that we will be king or queen and reign forever and ever on an ultimate throne. That's for the Lord to provide to David and ultimately to Jesus Christ. But nevertheless, the Lord is kind and gracious, and he is good to us. And how are we to respond to his grace and to his mercy? Well, David is a, is a fine example by God's grace here, we are to respond with thankfulness. We are to worship the Lord in love and obedience. And as Paul says in Romans 12, we are to offer ourselves as living sacrifices. We're called to give our entire selves to God, who demonstrates his greatness in establishing this kingdom, but who establishes his people. In verse 22, we see this type of response as David declares in response to the Lord's grace. Therefore, you are great, O Lord God, for there is none like you, and there is no God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. Praise be to God. There is no God like our God. He is the one and only, the one living and true God. And there are many people institutions, others who would claim to have that place or at least place themselves in that position, but they're all imposters, all false gods, all idols. God stands alone, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and he is merciful toward his people. There is no God like our God, and also there is no people quite like God's people. <laughs> The Lord is called a peculiar people. You can take that word any way you'd like. A peculiar people to make them like him. As God has called his people out from the rest of the world through election, but then through sanctification to make them holy, and ultimately through glorification to make his people like Jesus. Several of these themes all come together upon Christ in this passage. And ultimately, then, we see our place as his people within his house. We see God as ex uh, who exalts and is exalted. We see David who is humbled in response to the Lord's mighty work. 
And yet the Lord establishes an everlasting kingdom for David and his descendants, thus exalting him higher than any earthly king. I think in this little example of David being blessed, of him being humbled beneath the great power of the Lord, but then of the Lord raising this humble king up to be the exalted king over the earth, we see here an example of our Lord Jesus as well. We see both the creator-creature distinction, that God is different from his creation, and that we can never assume the position of our Lord, never should we try. But we also see what theologians have often called the two estates of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you know this, I trust, especially from passages like Philippians chapter 2. The Son of God, Jesus Christ, is eternal. He is being made, he is existing in the form of God. The Son of God is God himself. And being divine, he has a right to all glory, all honor, and all praise. But as Paul says in Philippians, he did not consider this equality with God something to be grasped. But he emptied himself. Now don't misunderstand. He did not cease to be God, ever. He did not lay aside his divinity. He did not lay aside his, his prerogative of being worshipped in the highest heavens. He did not change, according to his divine nature, anything of the sort. But what did the Son of God do? He emptied himself by addition, not by subtraction. He humbled himself by taking on the form of a servant. That is, he took to himself a human nature. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. The eternal Son of God came to us. Being conceived in the womb of the Virgin Mary, he was born. And he came under the subjection of the law and all the infirmities of this life. Well, why did he do that? To redeem us. To die on behalf of us, in our place. Then to be raised from the dead to give us life everlasting in his name. Do you see the exaltation of the Son of God who then was brought low? He was brought down. He was humbled in the form of a servant even to the point of death. But what did the Lord God do then as this great high king now is humbled even in the grave for three days? Philippians 2.9 says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in uh, heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus Christ moved from an estate of humiliation unto the estate of exaltation. He was raised up. And this is exactly the pattern of the Christian life. Paul starts that whole section in Philippians by saying, have this mind among yourselves, brothers. And though the Son of God is God himself, that he was made low out of love and service toward his people. And we aren't to think of ourselves as God and that we're condescending to to God's people. But it's the mindset of self-sacrifice, of service, of humiliation, and ultimately suffering according to God's purposes unto glory. Suffering unto glory. This is the pattern of the Christian life. And we, as God's people, are being conformed to his image in suffering now and humiliation so that we too would one day be exalted to share in his subsequent glories through the resurrection of the dead. Suffering is not just something that we endure now as Christians for a time in order that we would be exalted through the resurrection when our Lord returns. You need to understand that suffering is not just a thing that happens, but it actually is the pathway the road of the Christian life unto glory. It's through suffering, conformity to Christ's sufferings, that we then enter into his glory. And we see that here also in 2 Samuel 7. 
And we see how the Lord exalts his people throughout biblical history. There have been so many demonstrations of God's greatness, and as David recounts biblical history, he also recounts many of these great demonstrations of God's power. Of course, we know that God brought Noah and his family through the flood, the flood waters of judgment, and ultimately brought him into a new creation. That he also promised Abraham a people and a place wherein he would dwell. In 2 Samuel 7, verse 23, David starts to speak about the exodus in which God brought his people out of Egypt and established them, bringing them through the wilderness unto the promised land wherein they would rest. They would have peace from their enemies. And here we also know that God establishes an everlasting kingdom for his people. Now we may be tempted then to think that that's it. That now the nation has been brought out of Egypt through the wilderness across the Jordan River. They have been established in Canaan. And now they, they are, Solomon's going to build this temple and they're going to live there forever and ever. And that's the fulfillment of the everlasting kingdom, right? Well, there are people that think that. And that since that kingdom doesn't exist right now on earth, that one day they'll rebuild it. And then we'll have another earthly kingdom forever and ever. But brothers and sisters, that misses the entire point. The earthly kingdom is not the ultimate kingdom. Now, I don't mean to say that on into the future we'll never have a kingdom that we could see and touch, but I mean to say the ultimate kingdom we look forward to is one of the new heavens and the new earth, not this present earthly age. The theocracy, that is, David's descendants merely by blood, the theocratic kingdom that we see in earthly Israel is not the consummate everlasting kingdom to come. Now it's certainly related to it. I don't mean to say it has nothing to do with it. But we need to understand that what we see with David and Solomon is a type, it's a shadow of the great and lasting kingdom to come at the end of days when our Savior Jesus Christ returns. And in promising David an everlasting kingdom, God is not promising to continue replacing genetic descendants of David time after time, each and every time an earthly king dies and is buried, and on and on, forever and ever, a new king will be born, and a new king will ascend and reign on that throne. You may know the teaching of the epistle to the Hebrews. All of that book is meant to point us to the supremacy of Christ, how Jesus Christ is greater than the angels, how he's greater than Moses, how he's greater than Abraham, how he is greater than all the Levitical priests. Do you remember that section of that book? On how significant Christ's priesthood is. In the Old Testament, all the priests descending from uh, the Levitical order, a tribe of Levi, they would have a great high priest, one among them all, who would serve every year, specifically on the Day of Atonement, and offer this great high sacrifice for the sins of God's people. And that high priest would do that special work once each year. But even before doing it, he would have to offer a sacrifice to cover for his own sins. And that high priest would serve until he died. And then what would happen? They would have another one. And that guy would serve until he died. And that guy would serve until he died. Over and over and over. That whole line of priests would continue on, but the very existence of them and the fact that they would die and have to offer sacrifice for their own sins demonstrated that this could not possibly be the ultimate scenario. That these priests and their own death begged for a greater priest to come who would offer sacrifice for sins once for all, not over and over and over and over every year, but who would do it finally and fully. And that's exactly why the author of Hebrews talks about Christ not serving as a high priest according to the Levitical order, but serving according to the order of Melchizedek, that mysterious figure from Genesis 12, who has no beginning and no end. Now, Melchizedek was a human. He's not just some strange guy who popped up out of nowhere and then disappeared on into the ether. But he has no recorded genealogy in the Bible. 
And that is significant because Jesus here serves once and for all. We never expect Jesus to offer sacrifice for sins and then have to repeat the process after he dies and then we need another Christ. He is the final high priest. He is the final prophet who has spoken once for all, his climactic word. But so also here in 2 Samuel 7, we should come to know deeply that Jesus Christ is the final and ultimate king. There will be no other sons of David to reign on the throne after Christ. Yes, he died, but he was raised from the dead and is seated on that throne forever and ever. No one to succeed Jesus Christ our Lord as king any less than they might succeed him as prophet or priest. But what to make of this promise for a time when the nation went into exile? We know that David reigned on the throne. Solomon reigned and had peace from his enemies and did so many great and wonderful things. But just as soon as Solomon passes, we have a civil war. The nation is split roughly in half, so to speak. And from then on, we have a succession of kings, a few good ones, but most of them not so good. Children, you know that as you read the stories of the kings of Israel and Judah. It is not a lovely sight or a story to read. And eventually, the nation is so faithless that the Lord prosecutes his covenant against them, and he removes them from the land. He takes them away into exile Where's the king then? Did the promises of God fail? Jehoiachin, the king of Judah, lived in exile at the house of the king of Babylon, and he even ate at his table, as described in 2 Kings 25. But just as a matter of history, there were years where he was not reigning properly over Israel, and there was no visible house of God. Does that mean that God has reneged on his promises? that he has taken back his word, and that he, in fact, is not abiding by what he promised to David. Not at all. Brothers and sisters, we need to raise our eyes to the ultimate fulfillment of this promise. Beyond the earthly sphere, ultimately, the fulfillment that we have in Jesus Christ and how he has made his word firm in Jesus In verse 25, David asks the Lord to confirm his word to him. Starting in chapter 8, David will lead the armies of Israel to defeat many of their enemies. But we see that this promise here is just one step in an overarching plan and purpose that God has for his people. The Davidic covenant is but one administration of the covenant of grace. And what the Lord was doing with David and then with Solomon ultimately finds its consummation in Christ, David's son and David's Lord. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He has conquered his and our enemies, and he continues to rule over us and to defend us from all opposition. And he will reign now and always. His kingdom is forever. Rest in that fact, in that truth. That he has conquered sin. He has died to pay the penalty for your sins, not his own. And he's been raised from the dead, ascended on high, and sits on God's throne forever and ever. This is your king. Whenever we face adversity as the church, we know that we have such a king who is Lord over all. We can rest in him, trust in him. Acknowledge the Lord's greatness and seek to worship and serve him with all of our being, all of ourselves, our heart, soul, mind, and strength, now and forevermore, for we indeed are his people. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for our exalted King, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you that there will never be a day, Lord, when we will have a dead King and have to seek for another But Christ reigns over all and he rules over all. And we yearn for that day when he will return in the clouds. When he will finally vanquish all of his enemies. When he will purify his church fully. When he will conquer. And Father, where we will enter into our final rest. 
the new heavens and the new earth, that heavenly Mount Zion, that heavenly Jerusalem. Father, we yearn for that day to come. Come quickly. But Lord, we pray in the meantime that you will bring all of your sheep into your fold, that you will conquer their hearts, and that you will change them, regenerate them, save them, purify them, and incorporate them into this house, the very body of our Savior Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Let us sing our hymn of response, number 295, Crown Him with Many Crowns, hymn 295, and let's please stand as we sing. Receive now the benediction. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.